we did this yesterday. Uh, so then I've been asked, I think some of the technical you know, stuff wasn't working correctly. And so they want me to repeat today. And it's sort of hard to do the same thing twice. Uh, but since there are new people here, uh, are, were some of you not here yesterday? Okay. Then that's good because I hate to do the same thing twice, the same people and bore them to death. Um, because of, of time and materials and everything, I'm only going to talk about drawing. And as a painter, I paint um, fairly slow. I'm not like a Bob Ross or something. I don't do a painting in a half an hour. It takes me a, maybe a month to do a very large painting. And that's working every day. Um, so for me to do a painting demo, it would be, painting demo would be very boring. So like yesterday, I did a, a demo on um, pen and ink because that breaks drawing down to this most simplest form. Um, with pencil, all as children will pick up a pencil and try to draw. Or you start drawing, and you got your little grays and gradations. With um, ink, we only got black and white. Nothing else. Even when you put little lines or dots or something down to make a gray, it's still black and white. And so people develop inking techniques or drawing techniques, but um, with inking, there's, like I said, it's such a primal level, just black and white. Um, I see a lot of artists, young artists starting out, uh, they try to get in too many gray tones. And either by using lines or dot. When a person, t to me, uses dots, starts stippling to put in a gray, that makes me think they haven't been inking very long at all. Because the first inking class I ever had was in college. They didn't really, at first it was just some Indian ink and water and brushes and you slap them in. The next it's like, like well, draw something without the water, just pure ink. And so you can hear everybody in the class. No, that's the first step you would do. So when I see stippling, I usually think you haven't been inking very long. Um, the other thing is lines. Lines. Um, and some people just carry away with lines. So your black line has the same strength as any other black line on there. It's just no, it's not a gray line. So you've got to watch how you use your line. So I look at, I look at inking as like uh, you've got two large things to work with. This, this is it. Your pure whites and your pure blacks. And when you start uh, ink drawing, think of those things as part of your composition. Um, now, I'll probably draw a little scene or something here, but like if you're doing work, uh, like a comic book and things like this, you've got panels or frames if you're doing a standalone piece. Plan it out where I can use pure blacks and pure whites. Because that, that's your big, two big weights that's going to balance this thing. And all your line work is like icing on the cake. It's like spices. It's, it's like the, the black and the white is like if you're fixing bread, it's like your dough and your water or something. You know, there's two big ingredients. But your line work is like salt and pepper. And it's very important how you use them. And so I'll just um, start with something pretty simple. Uh, Inking a face right now, uh, or I might do one later, but if we have time. But um, you don't use a whole lot of lines and faces. You want to minim minimize your line work. And uh, the freakiest things I've ever seen people do is they ink a baby's face. And they put in all the little lines. Now the baby looks like it's a 150-year-old freaky thing. You know, not even a baby. It's sort of scary, you know. All you need to do is put sharp keys in you got them on. Uh, so like, especially a baby, tells you, you, the very minimal ink lines you can put on a face, the safer you are. 
eyes, maybe a hint of an eyebrow, a hint of a nose, dug it on the lips and not another line on that face. And you get into younger people and like women, minimize line, you know, the least amount of lines you can get away with, do that. Uh, now you're a hero or you're an old wizard or something, yes, you can, the more lines you put on him, the more character he gets, and if you put him in the right places. And, and the rougher they look and whatever. But um, so we'll start out like I'll uh, do like I do like what I did yesterday. <clears throat> but um, see, see. So let's start with just a rock, okay? All right. Everybody knows what rocks look like, but do you really know what rocks look like? <laughs> Um, a lot of people they'll draw rocks and uh, we've got some rocks over here. Yeah, that could be water dripping or lots of things, you know. Um, this is one thing I did as a child all my life. I started doing this and I do it today. Is learning how to see. Um, when you look at things, look at the shape, look at every detail of something. And I've got like a mental library of of rocks, grass, weeds, trees, bark, water, fur, everything. I've looked at it, held it, felt it, and put it to memory. The textures, the shapes. You've got to learn to see. Uh, you can look at things, and the prime example for me was the first time I was going to paint a sky. I looked at skies since I was a baby, right? They're always there. <laughs> So I'd planned this big painting, a 30 by 40 painting, and I had about this much sky to paint. I had it all drawn out. I started painting this sky, just a blue sky with some white clouds. I saw blue and white. And I painted on that sky trying to get it right for like two days. And I realized I didn't really know what skies look like. I threw the whole painting away. Didn't finish it, just threw the canvas frame. And so the, I started photographing skies. Almost every time a storm or a strange uh, weather affects, I better take a picture of the sky. And I started setting the color, and I started trying to mix a color to match. And I realized that skies are not what you think they are. They're not blue with white clouds. Even the blue is not, they don't make a straight tube paint that's that color blue. It's got to be mixed. The clouds, oh my God, clouds can have subtle colors, all kinds. They look white, but boy, they're not. And so I really, that's when I started my journey of truly learning how to see color. But it was, I had a natural talent for like just seeing shape. Once I understand the shape, I can rotate it in my brain and draw it from any angle. It might not be easy, but I can still do it. So I've looked at and played around a lot of rocks before. And uh, this one, we're going to have a big rock here. And now we got to put, let's say, our light source is coming from this direction. And um, so we want um, to put shadows on this, on this rock to give it a shape. So, and like I said, all we got is a straight pin of me. I'll put, put a few little cracks like in this rock to get an idea of its shape. So black and white, so you want to stay with that as much as possible and save your line work. Same thing. So, Okay, that's sort of giving me a basic idea of what this rock's going to look like. Then I'm going to use parallel lines at different angles to give little planes like on this rock. And we'll do it sort of randomly, but it'll give the rock a, a, a sort of ragged surface. So I'll start here. And this 
it's just adding some grays to it. But like I said, the grays are black lines. You So now all of a sudden, you can see dimensions of this rock, right? I can see this at the top and it's cold and on the side and going shut up. Strictly black, you know, like I said, watch your black lines. Now I have a little bit of grass around here. And again, we think grass, that's boring. Okay, the only time you see grass that grows like this is on a golf course, okay? It's not real guys it's cultivated it's shaped it's sculpted or a football field or something like that in real life grass grows in clumps in the wild or in most yards it's like tiny little clumps and in the wild there's different types of grasses and some of these clumps would be very tall clump weeds some shorter it's always this variety, this mixture. And you got to be aware of that. You start drawing, like if I do all my grass the same height, I look like this is a golf course and this is going to be an obstacle jump. So you take that into consideration. So I'm going to start adding some grasses here around the base of this rock. I might add a few little different kind of weed things to it. Pretty soon you've got a little grassy bank going here. And you're always thinking, as I'm putting lines down, I'm not thinking, I'm thinking as much about the space around the line as I am the line itself. I'm leaving whites and adding a few blacks plus my line. So you're working that positive and negative all the time. You're thinking, you're not thinking line, line, line. You're thinking this black and this white, and go to the line drawer. You might want to extend the black and we'll leave some white to give it a texture, an uneven quality. Like I said, yes, I feel like Bob Ross. Happy little rocks and grasses and by the way Bob Ross babysat James when he was a kid <laughs> okay so we got us a rock here and sometimes the reason I when I do some of these I'll do this because let's start with let's say a rock because I was giving an art class one time and this girl said you know, I love that she's an engineer by trade to make her living that way, but she said it'd be one of those days, it's rainy, and you got your favorite music on, you get a glass of wine, and you get your drawing pad, and you sit down, like, this is a beautiful day to draw. And I look at my pad, and nothing, nothing, I rack my brain, nothing. I said, well, I'm like that, and I don't, I don't really have anything in mind. I said, just start out, draw a rock. And uh, she said, well, why do you draw a rock? I said, well, I go back in my little mental library, and mine's old school. It's not like a computer. i got to go down a little hall in the room, and there's little drawers with the little cards, catalogs, and like, what, rocks, okay? And there's sand rocks, limestone rocks, there's boulders, there's pebbles, but I've all put the memory. And I said, I do trees the same way. Everything I draw, I've got little, I've got memory snapshots in my head for my whole life. I, I put the memory. This other girl raised her hand. I said, what? She said, I don't even have a library card. And <laughs> so I was like, well, you need to start working on one, you know. But somehow, when I was a child, I remember just looking at bark on a tree and rubbing my hands over it and just putting it to memory leaves patterns uh, everything just understanding how it's made if i understood how it 
the shape, I could draw it. If you don't understand the shape, you can't draw it. You'd be like a three-year-old, wah, you know. Um, so we'll, we'll continue on. So like I told her that, I said, draw a rock. And then I did draw a rock, draw a tree beside it or something, you know. And um, so we'll do that here, and it'll get me into talking about something. I think I do my rock too high, and my tree I'm have to minimize. Well, I know what I'll do. I'm going to put a... Um, some bushes in here, and I'm going to put the base of a tree, and I'm going to put another over here or something. I'm trying to think ahead of it. So I'm going to put some uneven, broken, squiggly marks here. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, what is he drawing? What you also do to help draw, especially in pen and ink, and in everything. There are patterns in nature. They're everything. And it looks like uh, randomness, but these patterns can be repetitious. They are random, but they follow repetitious patterns. They, they form repetitious patterns. Um, like, um, well, like the wrinkles in your clothing. These wrinkles, you, you're, you're familiar with these, you've seen them all your life. They look random, but they follow a pattern of what, how you're moving and everything else. Everything in nature has these patterns. And you learn to see these patterns, and it'll help you understand shapes and help you draw, not only with pencil, not only with paint, but with ink. So, and trees and bushes and things, really, when you think about it, you know how they grow. They grow from a base, a little like a little trunk or something, even bushes and stuff. Then little limbs spring out, and all these out there, then there's eventually more little limbs and there's leaves, and it can be a full bush like that. Okay, I gotta draw that. I'm not gonna draw every freaking leaf on that bush. If I leave it white, it looks like snow or something. I, I've got to put blacks in it. I've got to give it shape. How do I do that? When the sun's shining on these on a tree or a bush or something, if you could forget about the green or whatever the color of the bush is, and break that into a, a black and white and a high contrast, you will start to see the shadows underneath the leaves, a clump, more of a clump since here because a bigger limb come out here, and at least a bit of a hole so shadows in here, and then out here all these leaves are sitting and there's little shadows in that. And they and the, these random looking patterns, but they're also reflecting the structure of the tree. You learn to see those. It's not hard, but you have to look at something and push it farther. And so this I'm gonna start putting in some blacks. To help give this bush some depth. Now at first it'll just look like sort of crap. <laughs> but then we'll have to work some other stuff into it. See if the lights coming in, this is more the back side, so I might put some heavy shadows in here. Okay, then I'm going to come back in and break up some of these hard edges. I use some of these same kind of little interwoven parallel lines. It, it sort of controls the direction of a shadow, which also will show you the in and out of the of the white negative area or leaving it. It gives it shape. Some of these little things in here, these could be parts of the sticks or little twigs in here. 
you fiddle with it until it looks about right. Okay. Now from there, we'll start putting, let's, let's put some coming out from here. Tree. And we all sort of know what trees look like. change this tree a little bit because by the time I get to the leaves in this, I'm going to room. So, you know your light source? I use just a lot of broad and thicker lines like this running. I use my shadow lines. It's almost a little bit of a contour or shape. I'm always, I don't put them there just to be, I don't use a lot of cross hatching. That tends to block up and gets more confusing. If you're using parallel lines and put them in directions, it helps give shape and contour. Now, you don't do pure contour lines, and your whole drawing circle looks like a map. <laughs> but, but these lines, I can swap, help give me little planes and surfaces. So, I'm going to, this shadow here is from the leaves that's going to be above it, it's coming out of the tree. And I'll shadow this side. We can always put a knot hole or something in it down here. This side you want to go right on. Strength is really helps give it shape, texture a little bit, that bark pattern. Okay, we'll go back and give it shadow again. Let's say that the bottom part of these leaves. Let's start about here. This is the shadow side. So these dark patterns, they look totally random, but I'm still thinking of tree structure behind them, how that tree is working. Uh, the limbs with the direction of the light. So I'm wrapping this part in. I'm using like a landscape of nature to tell you this is there's such a variety of, of learning processes to go through. If you draw just people all the time or just square buildings with glass and all the time, that's easy. You're going to follow the same pattern. You draw man made blocks. The only thing that's going to be harder is to figure because it's not blocks and squares. We flow, we're like a tree, we're part of nature animals, trees, everything. I grew up in the country, I'm from the country. Everything I looked at my whole life is organic. From my mother and father to you walk outside, the only thing man made was a little old house. And it was so old, there wasn't a lot of perfect planes or squares and that. It was it sagged and stuff here and there. I love old buildings in Europe, the ones that's been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's not a straight line to them. There's big wooden beams come down, another one up here, and the thatch roof, and there's nothing squared up. They're, they're organic, and they're beautiful. But then when I go to town, 
with the city entered by the squire and by angles and bias and rank and order to it all. And it was boring. And I was like, God, there's no beauty here. The only thing I've seen close to man structures that are beautiful besides those old, old houses and cottages is um, cathedrals. Beautiful, big, old cathedrals. What they try to do is, is in a way, mimic nature. The big columns come up and branch out like limbs and through the arches and the designs and intricate patterns. And it wanted you to have a a warmth feel about it, even though it was gigantic, but it is closest to walking through a forest with light coming in multicolor light. It gave a feeling of, and I wouldn't mind living here, of course it's quite large, but I could build me a little fire over here and, <laughs> and live, it's beautiful. It had a more organic feel to it. So, but, but anymore, almost everything you see around you is man-made, especially if you live in a city, and it's it's on angles, it's constructed, and you, okay, so you can learn to do some buildings at that, that's pretty easy, and then it's like, now I, I gotta draw something in nature, I'm lost. Now, after that, I'm gonna add a few more, a little bit smaller lines to break this up, it'll give me shadow patterns. I don't want it all to be too high contrast each other. A little breaking up. Well, my grass, thanks. I'm almost working on a tree. Yeah. And you can also do this, and usually I do, I sort of squeeze this tree in here. Um, I sometimes run some limbs across here, and I come back here and make another dark area with some of the white trunk showing through. You break it up, and you can, on these limbs, you can come out here, like right here, been a good place to, to do a, a negative area. A limb and use blocks around it, and you can be in the right, right proportion. And you can run around, and even when you get up so far, you can start breaking it down into limbs. As it breaks out of the big, full leaf patterns there. I'm so great at explaining, it's just where my brain works on painting, it's not very verbal. It's but there's a lot you can do with, with trees like that and do a lot. And then when I paint a tree, I work on the same basic assumption where my darks are going to go because the color is going to change, where the light's hitting, it's going to get lighter, colors change. So I'm working on the same principle. So this is the foundation. Lots of times when I work out a landscape to do in a, in a painting, um, Sometimes with black and ink, the first rough, you see the contrast, see what's going on. Like, oh, then you can break it down to a more refined one and do it in pencil or something. Then you start putting more grays. I'll put a couple more little rocks in here to break this back up. I can put an end of this back in here. We'll put some more weeds in here. Get a flow go down the hillside. Yeah. I'll go negative or uh, positive again, blacks, and create some broken. And after you do this a lot, you learn how to end something. You know, you come here like, I'll do grass, or where do I stop the grass? Where do I stop the rocks? All these little problems you run to. And you sort of learn how to just sort of fizzle it out. <laughs> And of course, you can use this negative space as weeds and stuff and sticks again. Just add some 
blacks and white places. It's these patterns again, these repetitious patterns are random patterns. Now, when I got the army, I got a job at Fort Knox as an illustrator. I was civilian. I wasn't in the army, but I, it was my first job. And they decided that now that the U.S. Army was all volunteer, Houston was drafting. They drafted college graduates and young professors and everything. You just got drafted. When they started making them volunteer, especially at the very first, nobody volunteered except people that was down and out, didn't have nothing, they needed a job, and they could go join the freaking army. And so they weren't the highest educated people in society. <laughs> and so they, they didn't read much. And so the military is like, okay, we've got to make our manuals more like comic books. Because they would, if it's visual, they would look at the visual stuff, but they wouldn't sit and read a boring manual. So they decided we're going to redo all the how to fight manuals and we're going to illustrate them pretty heavily. And I like that because I mean, I got to draw more pictures. In ink, still like a comic book. Well, first of all, I ran into a problem. It's like you got an M60 tank sitting here with it maybe under a big tree. And then downrange so far, there's a T62 Soviet tank and there's several acres and maybe a river and you had to show the distance and then you'd have the back hills he's doing a whole landscape on it how do you ink it i could do it in pencil but i couldn't ink it so okay how does the comic guys do it so i started looking at comic books they don't most superheroes live in cities it's just squares and angles and blocks they don't go to the country hardly at all I did find the issue of Swamp Thing that had a big tree done pretty good. But landscapes, piss on landscapes, they don't do it because they're hard, okay? So I kept looking. I had to have somebody somewhere done as ink landscape, surely. I found Hal Foster, Prince Valiant. He did a lot of landscapes because his whole story was about Vikings and stuff. They're on the sea. I got to see how you can ink water. And... But he, he didn't do a lot of that. For, for the comic book guy, it's easier to do some talking heads or sort of close-ups and eliminate backgrounds. And then sometimes you've got to put the big background in. And so there might be a whole big landscape, um, island in the distance at sea with all the trees. And I, so I started learning some there. It still wasn't helping me. I needed close-up vegetation, different, different. How do you do it? I'm desperate now. Well, I was getting... I wanted to look at black and white stuff, my color. So at that time, Creepy and Eric and Vampirello were out, those magazines. And they were done in black and white. You'd see some landscapes in there. But again, almost everything happens in the cities. It's like, if you leave the city, there's no world. It's just gone. It's just wild animals. That's it. But most of humanity in this fantasy has not been in a city it's been out in the boondocks and little bitty villages it's really cool and twisty and old <laughs> and um so i was in a, a, a drug store back then and they, all the drugstores had magazine racks and everything. i started looking at some magazines and i picked up say these used to be you see a lot of them ever ever magazine rack there was a lot of these little books on building like house plans I picked one up. I was, I was just thinking they'd have all the house plan, and over here they have a little brick house, a picture ink um, drawn. That looked when it's finished. It was inked, but mainly it's brick or stone to street through the lines. But and I'm like, yeah, and all of a sudden I started looking. It's like they would have a house here. I realized that these artists hated their job. Drawing the blueprints and drawing the house was dull and boring. Well, I started noticing it's behind the house, around the house, the shrubbery, the big oak tree in the back. And I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. These guys are inking landscapes. And they didn't go real far back, but they would go back maybe in reality like an acre back, like, like 200 yards behind the house. They would 
if you carry it away and do a bit more vegetation, maybe their boss come by. That's enough. You just got to get it done. But they enjoyed that, and it didn't take me long with these magazines. I spotted about three or four artists that was really, they couldn't sign them, but their, their landscapes was their signature. And these little magazines, like 35 cents a piece, so I'd buy five or six, go home, cut out the good ones, and start my own scrapbook and study these. And I learned more from those guys inking that terrain. Some of them weren't good at it, but some of them were like masterpieces. So as I got better at on my ink landscapes, so I'd say, yeah, I'll draw a tank and I'll draw this because I love doing all this landscape in between. And my boss finally came by one day and said, look, you're a good artist. He said, we're, you're not a, we're not doing Rembrandt's. Uh, he said, just a simple landscape. He said, you're doing a landscape so well, you're actually camouflaged. And I said, that's how they'd be in real life. He said, yeah, but we got to teach a lesson here. You know? I said, he said, your landscapes are beautiful, but hey, back off, you know. But I thought, okay, then I'm doing a good job. So I backed off there, but with my own stuff, I was really doing a lot of, uh, uh, I learned to ink, ink landscape. And one of the big problems you get is, you're only doing black and white, and you're going back, you got to show distance. I don't know, how do you do that? How do you do that? Okay, one of the first things I'll do here, this is sort of a little rerun of what I did yesterday, but I'm going to put a line of, like, low trees, Here. And this is back at a little bit of a distance. Exactly what I did yesterday. I did saw this thing yesterday, but um, I think I already said that uh, something was wrong with the speed of the things, and I sounded like I've been breathing helium when I was talking, and I was going super fast. <laughs> so we're doing this today. All right. Now I'm going to have this. Field here where this is at the end. So I'm gonna I'll put one little little This is showing a little bit of distance back here. Do another one. Stuff up with bigger bushes and weeds. So, okay, here's a whole line of trees. Oh, what am I going to do? Am I going to do this to it all? No. But it's going to lose everything. I'm going to leave them white. All right. But I'm going to start worrying about the trees behind it. So you just work. Okay, first of all, I'm going to do this. I'm going to start another kind of a tree here. Just to end, this is a, like a berry for me. I don't want to do And I want to start another line. Trees here. These a little bit more sketchier. Not as solid. Okay, now I, I get this far and here I'm like, okay, I got a row of trees and a row of trees, but they're both the same, you know. How do I, how do, I do that? What I do, I've got to separate them. So I learn simply by, I've got black and white and gray to work with. So I've got white and white. Let's make these a gray, just to break up the distance. So, I don't like this. I don't have to put in a lot of detail. These are farther back. So I just start by 
the straight parallel lines, okay? Of this is different than painting because if I was painting this, it look this is a darker value than that, but so it should be receding, it should be like no. You've got with paint, you got a million different colors here, you got black and white, so so you got to play a game of how do I break this up, you know. And uh, to, to show what I need to show now, you can if you want this to be like a really good doing drawing, come back in here. And so this and add a little bit. Yeah, that brush is not good. Yeah. You could break this back in here. It would look like the shadow of these trees, right? You can even put I see a little white streak, it almost looks like the trunk of a tree. So you can keep adding. Not doing a whole lot. Now to, to get this, um, you still want to do a little blend in, so I would never bring any gray, any lines up to here. You want this to be a barrier. But down here, you could do that same little process. It starts to give these trees a little bit of an undershadow back here. It just breaks it up and gives a little bit more distance to the water. So you could do this all the way across this area. Just a little bit in here. Don't do much because if you start doing a lot of parallel lines out in here, you've got it'll start to look blocky tree. Like I've been trimmed <laughs> at angle. So this has got to be very sort of spontaneous and small, not a whole lot of work. You can even throw a little bit in here, but you can't get up here to get in these lines because we're building layers of um we're building layers of depth and we don't have all the grays in the world like your pencil the values or all the colors you've got black and white so I'll stop this here now I'm going to jump back up we've got another kind of tree going alright this we're going to put a different kind of tree And actually, in my mind, my little tree library, I've got several different kind of trees. The easy ones are, yeah, oh, hardwoods like oaks and stuff. I say easy, that's one type. Then you've got pines, evergreens, cedars. Um, there's certain basic shapes. There's these, I think it's, um, right now I know a lot of Europe, you see, in Europe you see these tall, sneak trees on the landscapes and stuff like windbreaks. Uh, account, common name tree that's different varieties. There's all these types of trees that you put to memory, uh, and I, I, when I've had the opportunity, I really study them. Even those tall, skinny trees in Europe, you know, they look like a shrub, but it's like 40 foot tall, you know. And um, but just from the memory, how they're made, how they're shaped. Now, this is a kind of tree when we was all kids, one of the first or second trees we learned how to draw was a Christmas tree, the same. Sawtooth pattern on one side, and on the other side, and we draw the ornaments in it, you know. So, as you look at these, like different kind of pines, and even cedars, they're not so even <laughs> like we drew them as a kid. You 
again, I'm putting It's just you draw these because you looked at all you can. I'm looking at the shadow, the, the the dark area, which really when you're drawing, I'm always putting in shadow. How do you get a shape? Like well, it's it shadows. So as even this rock, you see this would be the most direct sun here. But the shape that we see, if we could put in all the gray tones. It's all shadow. So you're always adding shadow. Especially when you're doing ink work, it is the high contrast. We'll make this tree behind the store trees. Then what you would do, you usually don't see just one by itself. So I'm going to rough in a couple more and show you one more thing to do. So what I want to do is I want to bring this gray over, all right, and then slowly go with black. I want these big trees like this to when I get over here to be silhouette. It's black. So I got to make the transition. So the transition is easiest is when you have a few trees farther apart and they get solid over here. So it's just a little playing ahead kind of trick. So I'm going to quickly, and these are going to be pretty rough because I don't want to waste our time here going tree after tree. All you do is hint at things in your eye fields, you know what? Eventually, go solid black. Just carry this type of stuff on through here to, to finish it up. I'll just it's getting a little bit more rougher. I don't want to spend all our time doing this. And you just keep filling a few of these trees till you eventually work it all solid black. The 
so now you're, and then I come back with the uh, same pencil I was pen I was doing on the bow, these parallel lines, and I will throw some of these in here in places. So you can see that this row of trees is behind here. But all I'm doing is making patterns was based on light and dark. Now, let's say that we got, all right, but there's still a, another stick and roll of trees I gotta get in here. Or, yeah, let's put them, um, let's do this. All right. I'm gonna do another sort of white row of trees again. The distance is getting farther. So my light coming this way, I'm gonna come out here. I wanna make this row like a shadow fall on this. Slowly start breaking it up. Um, yeah, let's do this. Let's pull out another. Add a little more to my tree here. I'll put another little, real distant hill here. And also add a little bit more. Right now, I'm just following like light and shadow patterns. This is where the light would hit the shadows would be. I'm going to do a little bit more up here. Because you're just trying to get shape with bare minimum work. Over here, and we'll run a little bit. These are just straight up and down parallel lines. This gives more shape to all of this. Now let's do, we'll do one more little thing here. Well, let's do this. One last thing. We want some big cliffs up here. So once you start drawing landscape like this, you can just keep adding and adding. As long as you know your line of sight and your perspective. This, these big rocks like this, is the shadow side, so they'll be pretty easy to work with. And when I do, for a painting, I'll do something similar to this, because it gets sort of random. You, you don't want to start drawing in all of it. It'll get too precise, too even. You do it like this, it gets more random, like it really is. And this is something I promise you, you don't see a lot of people doing demos on. Is inking a landscape. <laughs> because I know, because when I was looking for reference, <laughs> nobody did it hardly because it's hard. It's not that difficult. It's all in your, your attitude, the way you approach it, and your thinking. All it is. Inking the landscape is the same as inking a face. And the same, it's just you got one thought process on a face, you're not going to be doing too much of spontaneous stuff. But it's the patterns in the face. There's repetitious patterns, there's shadows. Um, uh, you know, when they say repetitious, pa uh, repetitious patterns, you know, there's your hair is random, repetition of strands or little strings, but, but there's patterns to it, the way it folds. 
Same thing with nature, same thing. All of nature, same thing. And something about color I want, want you to know. Nature, basically, nature is very muted on an everyday scale. You say, oh, no, it's not. Yes, it is. You drive down the road and you look at nature, but there is something man's made, a sign or anything, a thumb. It sticks out like a sore thumb. Nature is muted in color, even in skies and stuff. The only time it shows off, really, is maybe at sunset. And you're getting all those long red rays left in there, going to the oranges. The other time is it shows its colors in flowers, pure color in flowers, uh, animals, patterns, burn, scales, um, jewels, precious stones, but rocks. So, like you do in your painting, nature sets its background, it's color, but it's muted color. It's like, like I was saying, like it's, it's the water and the flower that makes the dough. But the jewels, the, the, is that pure color, it saves them for the right times. So why does you look at a hillside and there's uh, beautiful fall colors, these orange trees, they just seem to glow almost. And nature's showing off all of that. And in painting, most of paint, yeah, the, the, if it's nature, or even if it's man, like bricks and stuff, a lot of it, especially if it's old, the stone, it's not very bright, it, it's muted. So when you do add that cloth, that red dress, that rose on a, an old gray wall, those things pop. You know? That's when nature should So I think lots of times in painting, we tend to over, over colorize or over um, make the color too potent than what you normally see. A lot of paintings I see of landscapes that really I love, they really just get my attention. A lot of them are really muted landscapes, but the color is there, and it's like, oh man, I've felt this little feeling before. I've been in this landscape before. That artist caught everything just right. Those, it's easy to paint with bright, garish colors. It's hard, harder to find those muted tones and, and keep your values in it. Now, in this, to save off and make it more of a fancy thing, we could always add a slight heel back here. A little bit of shadow on this side, lightly. And we could always put a... back here <laughs> but um, and then you could also put and you've got a landscape all in ink and there's been times when I would try to draw this in ink, and I could work for two days and not get anything I like. And now I can sit down and draw one of these in well, not too long. And, um, well, I don't know, I'm actually if I didn't talk in old time. <laughs> but, um, it's, it's all about, as I try to explain, patterns, shapes, pure darks, pure whites, and use those lines 
is the spice, the binding, the little glue that holds it together. So, um, do we want to do? Do I? Okay. So this this is yeah. All right. Yesterday I did draw a face and a few things, and uh, but since this is a repeat repeat of the same class, I think James says we're going to go eat and stuff. So. I hope this taught you a little bit. This is just one thing I could show you things uh, of more, more patterns like in waters and rivers, uh, fur and chain mail, all this kind of stuff. There's patterns. So when you look at nature and you look at anything, look for those patterns and repeat in random patterns, but they're not random, but they look like it. You'll see, you'll see a pattern in random. So I thank all of you for being here and, and not getting up and leaving, okay? <laughs> thank you. Thank you.